apologize for my apology. Attributing my too tameness to long years of Andromeda's house training and that in turn to her father's domination by Cassiopeia, while at the same time admitting that as Andromeda herself had charged in the Sebasius affair, a better man would in the first place never stop that calypso pride. I did, began to apologize, stopped that, reflected a moment, then declared her under no obligation to attend me if she found my mind, manner, or manliness disappointing. But if she chose to stay, she must accept me on my terms, which for better or worse included, unlike Sebasius or Ammons, I dare said, permitting me to accept her on hers. No drachma but had its other side. Andromeda, in my opinion, had near hen-pecked me out of cockhood, but I had learned from her what few men knew, fewer heroes, and no gods, that a woman's an independent person in her own right should be respected, therefore, by the goldenest hero in heaven. If my pert priestess was unused to parity, as was I to novelty, then we had each somewhat to teach the other. <coughs> Calypso sat up and closed me in her lap. These conversations were all post-coitally, anyhow epiclimactically couched. But all I could get from her was, you, you, you're leaving something out. No help for that. Those letters, Perseus, those letters that she threw overboard, I droned, had voyaged in nautic history, I asked rhetorically, ever begun so crossed as ours, Andromeda's and mine, whose wreckage that day's mural had fixed forever. We had set out when spring gave way to summer, neither of us yielding to the other. Andromeda stormed at me. It must be Joppa without side trips, or she would go it unburdened of her had-been hero. I stormed back. If she wanted a lackey instead of a lord, she should have stuck with her Uncle Phineas. Thus we raged and counterbaited as we cleared the port. I perhaps our problem to be mixed marriage. Uh, 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 Argives and Ethiopians, I said, were oil and vinegar, palatable when right proportioned, but never truly mixable. Pa, she spat. All marriages were mixed, a man and a woman. <laughs> but there was my insufferable ego again, proposing three parts Perseus to one Andromeda, when in truth it was her rescue from monstrous Cetus that had made the reputation I had grown so puffed upon. She had, as it were, laid her life on the line to make me famous. I replied, not unfairly, I think, that even the bards who sang our story were wont to call her both the cause of my labor and its reward. That's what Ovid says, it's a beautiful line. Which was but putting prettily, I went on, less fairly, that had I bypassed Joppa altogether, I would have spared myself two hard battles with Cetus and with Phineas's gate crashers, plus the sustained one of our recent years together, and, ha and would have found me a more congenial princess somewhere else, whereas she'd have been fish food. Well, that always got to her. <laughs> she bawled back that what I had freed her from were but the chains in which my forebears had caused her to be put. She meant Uncle Poseidon, who had given Ammon word to cliff her when the jealous Nereids complained to him of Cassiopeia's boast, etc. She owed me nothing, more especially since I had manumitted her into the bondage of my tyrant vanity, a mere bed partner and accessory to my fame. It was just a matter in her view of exchanging shackles for shekels or iron manacles for gold. That always got to me. I stormed back, unfairly now, that even read as I read them, the poets were wrong. Freeing Mother Danae, not Andromeda, had been my mission, regaining my lost kingdom, resolving by the death of both the twinly old feud between Acrisius and Pretus, which had started in the womb. To this end, Medusa, not Fishicetus, had been my true adversary and chief ally. I hadn't even employed Medusa in the Cetus episode to dispatch which wanted but my trusty sickle and a bit of shadow fainting. In short, the whole Joppin adventure, charming as it was, 
could be regarded as no more than a couple of sub-panels, as it were, in the mural of my life, an interlude in, indeed, a diversion from my hero work proper. Danae, Danae, then had shouted Andromeda, you should have married your mother. Calixa clucked her tongue. You two really went at it, didn't you? I agreed, my face burning afresh. That's when she pounced upon the brass-bound sea chest on the poop, I said. We had lots of traveling bags, but I had decided to do the trip right, my trip, and had packed my things in the same old trunk that Granddad had shipped me off in 40 years before. For one thing, I thought Seriphian Dictas would be pleased to see it again, and so I had kept in it all my souvenirs piece of the net he'd fished us ashore with, the crescent scabbard of Hermes' sickle, couple of rocks from giant Atlas after I had stoned him, fern corals from Joppa, I had laid Medusa's head on seaweed while I skewered Cetus. That's the classical explanation of how coral comes to exist. Andromeda's leg irons, the Larison discus, and the letters. Those letters Perseus. I was left flanked on the couch. Naughty Calixa, propped on her elbows at my hip, amused herself as I spoke by scribing capitals on her forehead with my flopped tool as with an infirm pen. R S something P, the scrambled uncials of my name. Fan letters, mostly, I said. Nut mail, con letters, speaking invitations, propositions from women I never heard of, sort of thing every mythic hero gets in each day's post. I swear I didn't save them out of vanity, as she claimed. I almost never answered them. It was partly habit. I'm afflicted with orderliness. They were even alphabetized, starting with anonymous. Partly for... <laughs> Partly for amusement, to pick me up when I was feeling down, remind me I'd once got a few things done worth doing, but mainly I swear it was for a kind of research. What I mentioned once before, certain letters especially I read and reread, half a dozen or so from some dotty girl in chemist Egypt. They were Billy Doos, I admit it, but along with the hero worship was a bright intelligence, a lively style, and a great many detailed questions, almost as if she were doing a dissertation. How many had been the Stygian nymphs? Had Medusa always been a gorgon? Was it really her reflection in Athena's shield that had saved me from petrifaction, or the fact that Medusa had her eyes closed? And if the latter, why did I need the shield? How was it I had used the helmet of invisibility only to flee the other gorgons and not to approach them in the first place? Did everything that saw Medusa turn to stone or everything Medusa saw? If the former, how explain that sightless seaweed? If the latter, how came it to work after she'd been beheaded? Was my restriction to the adamant sickle and the shadow trick in the Cetus episode self-imposed or laid on by Athena? And if the former, was my motive to impress Andromeda with skill and valor rather than with magic? And if the latter, why? <laughs> Considering the crooked sword, the Grecian subterfuge, the rear view approaches to Medusa and Cetus, the far darting Hermian sandals, even the trajectory of the discus that killed Acrisius, would it be fair to generalize that dodge, and dis that dodge and indirection were my conscious tactics? And if so, were they characterological or by Athenian directive? Similarly, considering Danae's brass tower, the sea chest, the strapping tasks of Polydectes, Danae's bondage to him, and Andromeda's manacles on the one hand, and on the other, my conquests of Atlas, Phineas, Polydectes, and the rest by petrifaction, could not one say that my goal for myself and my gift to others was typically release from immobility, 
and my punishment, both of my medusa former enemies and my latterly tied down self, typically it's opposite. Oh, Calixa, this nameless girl, she had no end of insightful questions, which I pondered and repondered as I've done these murals to find if I could their meaning, where they pointed, what it was I had lost. One question alone, whether I felt my post-Medusan years to be an example of or an exception to the archetypal pattern for heroic adventure, <laughs> set me to years of comparative study to learn what that pattern might be and where upon it I currently was. Thus, this endless repetition of my story as both protagonist and author, so to speak, I thought to overtake with understanding my present paragraph, as it were, by examining my paged past, and, thus pointed, proceed serene to the future's sentence. My trustiest aid in this endeavor was those seven letters, at once so worshipful and wise, I'd have given much to spend an evening with their author. Hence my fury when Andromeda, herself unhinged by wrath, tore open the chest lid just off Hedra and threw him to the fish. For the first time in our life, I struck her. My eyes filled at that double memory. Calixa curled me in her way until my salt tears filled her navel. Post Swatley, I went on. I took from the chest my only correspondence with Andromeda, love letters written during my youthful trip to Larissa, and posted them with the others in the Gulf of Argolis. Then Andromeda, in a perfect tempest of outrage, fish-fed the entire contents of my chest, sure me of my valiant past as a steering drover bollocks a bull. We were so busy storming at each other, and the crew and galley slaves so enwrapped in our battle royal, none noticed the natural tempest till it struck a stern like the fist of a god, as if Father Zeus were counterpunching for smote Andromeda. All quarrels went by the board with mast and tiller. We were stove in a trice, sunk and drowned, all save my wife and me, who, still wrestling with the relatched ruin of my chest, were washed with it the way of its contents. Empty, it floated. Our grapple became a grip. The storm passed. The sharks were patient. Two days, the currents easted us, as in your picture, clutched and quarreling in the Sea of Candia. On the third, as if caught in a repeating dream, we were netted by a fine young fisherman, more the image of my golden youth than my own sons were. He congratulated us on our survival. He complimented Andromeda on her brinied beauty. He introduced himself as Danaeus, Dictus's son, and home ported us with the rest of his catch to Seraphos. Calixa squeezed me. I could listen all night to the way you talk. Thank you. Answer a question or two of, of Mr. John Barth, he would be happy to oblige. Uh, let's make this short. First of all, if anybody wants to split, split, and then we'll do this for about 10 minutes because my tonsils are about gone. Okay, look, you know, people are splitting, so let's pull it. Okay, let's split instead. <coughs> 
立ち居る。